Call the meeting of the order, City Council work session for City East Grand Forks <coughs> for March 12th, 2024. Reed, you take the roll, please. Mayor Steve Gander. Here. Council President Mark Olstead. Here. Council Vice President Tim Riepel. Here. Council Members Clarence Vetter. Here. Ben Pokshavinsky. Here. Dale Helms. Brian Larson. Here. And Karen Peterson. Here. Does term quorum number one, 2024 Gate City Bank Home Improvement Program. Mr. Huttonen. All right, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, here with us today from Gate City Bank are Becky Mindeman and a few of her team members in the lending program. Uh, they'd like to share a little bit with us about their improve, home improvement program uh, that will be the second year of the offering here in East Grand Forks. It was a new partnership that was created last year. Um, some details about the program and then I'll let Becky come up and, and add some detail to it. Uh, minimum loans available through this program start at $10,000 up to a uh, cost of $100,000. Um, available for major remodels, home additions, siding, roofing, windows, items like that. Um, and the initial step to the application process, if a homeowner is interested in making these improvements, would be to contact our Economic Development Authority or our Community Development Office. Um, and they'd be able to review your potential project, look at the, um, the, the criteria to see if it's something that may qualify, and then they'd be able to pass that along to the people at Gate City Bank to see if there's any lending that may be available for you. Um, one change from this program last year to this year is Gate City was gracious enough to increase the eligible home value up to $400,000. It was $300,000 is the cutoff for, for top uh, market value on the home. This year that will be $400,000. So hopefully that will open it up for a few more homes to be able to be eligible for the program. Um, with that, I think I'd invite Becky and anyone else from Gate City that would like to say a few words. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Gander, City Council. Thank you again for having us this year. Uh, as uh, Andy stated, uh, my name is, or excuse me, Reed stated, uh, my name is Becky Mindeman. I serve as the Senior Vice President of Retail Banking for the Northeast Region of Gate City Bank. And with me this evening, I have Brittany Clinton, Katie Graham, and Vicki Geller. Uh, they are the lending team who will be working with the City of East Grand Forks on this partnership. Uh, so at Gate City Bank, our core purpose is to create a better way of life for our customers customers, our communities, and our team members. The home improvement partnership that we have with the City of East Grand Forks is one of many similar programs that we offer across our footprint and is designed to revitalize mature neighborhoods by helping homeowners make repairs and upgrades at a very low interest rate. Uh, in 2024, we're happy to allocate $2 million uh, towards this program, which will encourage the preservation of homes and add to the long-term value and life of property and neighborhoods. Um, we really can't say enough how thankful we are to have this partnership with the City of East Grand Forks. Uh, we love the opportunity to help create a better way of life for friends and neighbors uh, by having a program that allows them to improve their properties. Uh, that's all that we have. Does anybody have any questions for us? Anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. Um, I noticed it does cover heating and cooling, so a new furnace and AC unit. Yeah. All right. Anybody else have anything? I see none. Okay. Thank you. We we do have a check. If we can grab a picture, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, because you can't do it. All 
right, and move on to number two review and consider BNSF construction maintenance and crossing closure agreements. Mr. Utnan. All right, thanks again, Mr. President. Mr. Galstead will join us for this item as well. Um, included in the packet were uh, so a few lengthy agreements related to the proposed quiet zone project. It really comes down to it's three separate agreements. There's a crossing construction maintenance agreement for 2nd Avenue Northeast and for Central Avenue Northeast um, that lays out the requirements during the construction phase of the project as well as sets out some additional requirements um, from BNSF for the crossing itself in perpetuity as long as there's a road crossing the railroad at that area. A um, couple of the concerns or notes on those agreements uh, are that uh, it does uh, pass the indemnity and the hold harmless for any type of damage or injury related to the railroad along to the city for the the life of the crossing. Um, there is some discussion, and I'll let Mr. Galstead go into that further. There is some discussion, and there's an attorney general's opinion that uh, cities uh, may not, likely would not be able to indemnify another organization for its own negligence. Um, but with that said, uh, any efforts to have this contract edited to reflect that from BNSF, I think beyond even our attempts here in East Grand Forks from a statewide perspective have typically gone unanswered. Um, BNSF has, has kind of the strong pull to set these agreements as they would like. And if uh, my feeling is with the efforts we've made, if we're going to pursue the quiet zone project, that this is the agreement that we're going to have to sign with BNSF. And then if at such time there ever would become a court proceeding for any type of damages or injuries that may occur, um, we would be able to um, have that attorney general's opinion on our side and, and have to have that fight at that time. Um, but that would be the first concern about the uh, the maintenance agreement uh, and then the, the closure agreement uh, that goes along with that. Um, we do know uh, that one of the requirements of our city charter is vacating the street crossing that crosses um, at Third Street in order to put the fence up that would close that intersection. That crossing, in order for us to vacate it by city charter, does require a public notice and a public hearing. We have previously, our city council has approved a resolution that it would close Third Street Crossing in, in its notice of intent to establish the quiet zone, but um, it does not appear that we held a public hearing when we approved that resolution back in, in December of 2020. Um, so, in, in this timeline right now, what, what I would propose is uh, in order to move the whole thing forward in unison together, we would post that we need to hold a public hearing with the intent of closing 3rd Street, um, have that public hearing at our April 2nd meeting, and then have all the subsequent resolutions and project bid awards that, that may take place, take place at that April 2nd meeting as well. That timeline is still within the 60-day window that the bids are good for. That that 60-day window would close April 7th. Um, so that's kind of the process I would lay out. And then I think I'd turn it over to Mr. Galstead for any additional concerns he'd like to raise with the agreements. Uh, thank you. Uh, and and uh, Reed, of, I mean, I, I got to hand it to Reed because he's been right on top of this. Um, and then just due to the fact that this, uh, I guess, project is going on four years, um, when he, in, in all fairness, he asked us all uh, different questions regarding this back in October. Um, my recollection and my files indicated originally regarding we'll just we'll just say this public hearing was that I provided a resolution and different uh, documents previously back in 2020, 2020 and. I just assumed that the public hearing was actually held. So now that we're going forward and and having to having to do this, I went back into my records. I saw that the information was provided to the city administrator's office, uh, as as Reed has indicated. However, I haven't seen any documentation that there was actually a public hearing to get comments <coughs> after notice uh, to be able to actually close that intersection. Uh, we actually have to have that notice of the, uh, of the hearing. And then if the council approves the resolution, then that notice and the resolution gets recorded 
at the uh, recorder's office. Uh, in this packet, there's also an ordinance. Uh, that's actually from the uh, railroad's perspective. Um, I'm going to have read or, or see if we can get them just to confirm uh, a resolution uh, because the resolution gets uh, adopted and recorded uh, so that we don't have to go through another uh, procedure for the ordinance. I have uh, uh, drafted a proposed resolution that includes all of the language that was provided for by the railroad. Um, so hopefully that would be able to uh, shortchange that. If not, we can do a resolution or we can do an ordinance. Um, however, that would ultimately be passed after uh, the second, just due to t timing issues. Uh, that's kind of the tail end of things. Uh, going through these uh, documents, I provided information to read and we've been trying to ferret this out uh, regarding the one-sidedness of these contracts. Um, I don't think anybody had, that's read them has uh, <laughs> uh, would quarrel with that. Uh, if you look at the indemnification quality and liability issues that are being passed on, um, everything becomes the city's responsibility. Now that's fairly normal in a lot of circumstances, especially in these construction circumstances. Uh, and we are uh, protected in, in a, a certain amount because we are requiring the contractors and the subcontractors to take on that responsibility. The concerns that I have and uh, have been looking at with the AG's opinion, other opinions, the Minnesota statutes, uh, and uh, in and basically have talked to the city of Grand Forks as well, is not so much the liability for the construction and maintenance. It's a future liability that our according to the emails that we've gotten from the, uh, the railroad, uh, go into the future. Um, there was the, uh, for instance, just, we'll just say just, uh, we're responsible uh, into the future for the signals, for the pedestrian gates, and anything that goes along with it. Um, the maintenance of them, if there's damage, unless it's their sole responsibility and negligence, which if in fact, now, and we can just give you a hypothetical, let's just say there's a uh, malfunction of the uh, signal crossings and a school bus gets smoked by a train and you have all kinds of carnage and death. Okay, our liability insurance only covers up to three million, two million, or three million dollars if we get, if if we get additional coverage. Anything over and that would potentially be the city's responsibility, based upon the way that they have got these lang the language, and what they are um, saying goes into perpetuity. Um, whether that happens or not, it's my due diligence to tell you that that's the possibility of this. And then we would uh, later on try to defend the fact that this was such a, a one-sided, take it or leave it uh, contract uh, that violated the AG's opinion. And then we try to refer back to the AG's opinion and any type of a defense that we would have with the, uh, the railroad uh, to include, there's some Minnesota statutes out there, I, I just was reading uh, 337, 01, 02, and 03 that essentially uh, prohibit indemnification agreements such as this in construction and building projects uh, over and above um, basically the amounts to be able to indemnify them. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that the city and the council was aware of those those uh, parameters when uh, you are fully informed regarding this vote on whether or not you want to have the quiet zone. Uh, you know, the uh, if you look at what the, the railroad has said, is they're providing us with some incentive to close the third street uh, intersection because they believe that that's in their best interest, but they're telling us that quiet zones uh, 
are not safe for them. That's why they're not doing it. So the, the, it's reduction in public safety instead of increase in public safety by having a quiet zone because the, from their standpoint, they're not able to blow their horns and they're not able to give the notice. And that's why they're not, uh, that's why they're asking for this indemnification and that's why they're not, in, according to their policy, in favor of quiet zones. And that's all I have uh, on that, <laughs> unless anybody has any questions. Thank you. Any more? I don't have any more unless there's questions for us. Okay. Any questions? See you none, sir. I guess I do have a question. Sure. <clears throat> I know, read according to what you shared that the likelihood of it being rewritten or written to accommodate BNSF having some of this liability would be low. I think we should exhaust every and all possibility of accomplishing that. If we think it's unreasonable that the city should take on this liability into perpetuity, we should know that we've exhausted every possible angle to get that into the contract back onto them. I would hope that we're going for equal measures of safety. We're not willing to jeopardize the safety of our residents. So I, I'm not going to acknowledge um, building um, crossings that are less safe than they are now because there, there are other factors too. I mean, the decibels of the horns coming through and the effect on little kids and their hearing long term, that's a, a safety factor also for lifelong problems for these kids. Um, so the idea that, that they're going to be able to put in a crossing that's less safe than what's there now is hogwash. You know, there are federal regulations that guide how these crossings can be done. It'll be built to the spec of the current federal regulation for safety for every element that's in there. And uh, we're not going to bring in a crossing that's any less safe than what we have now. We're not even going to acknowledge the possibility of that. That's not going to happen. What I'm saying is that's the position that the railroad is taking. That's why they're not contributing to any of the uh, the uh, quiet zone aspects of this. They're contributing to the closure of Third Street because it eliminates another crossing where they would have some some issues or some safety factors. They can say that. What they're really doing is shifting their liability onto us. That's I'm really not, what they're I, trying to he, do. I'm not arguing with that. I'm, I think we're talking the same I, thing. I yep. just, uh, and I just think that uh, everybody had to have that information before you go forward and you vote whether or not you want to have the safety zone, or the uh, quiet zone, excuse me. Don't worry, we're not angry at the messenger. No, I get it. I just wanted to make sure you knew. Thanks, Ron. Mr. Larson. Yeah, uh, Ron, one question for, for you. Um, looking through there, there was an email exchange that they used an example of, um, you know, if there was damage within those those gates caused by like a private citizen, that BNSF would go after that private citizen. And if that didn't work, then they would come to the city. Correct. Am, am I understanding that that correctly? Yeah, well, I, the way I believe that would be is, is they're going to own the property, which is kind of the issue that we're we're addressing and that however if there's damage to that property whether it's the signals or the pedestrian gates or whatever and there are there's damage to it whether it's from a car accident or some other uh, matter um, they will go after the individual first that caused the damage however if that if they don't have any insurance will say they, they're, they're basically not able to collect from that individual, then the city is totally responsible for it. And we've gone through the League of Minnesota Cities, we've gone through the League of Minnesota's, our, our insurance, uh, they're able to insure us if we want to pay or add an, a, a rider to our city policy to cover the signals. We also, uh, I shouldn't say we, but in conjunction with uh, Mr. Hutnan, um, gave them the scenario that I'm kind of giving you regarding future and whether or not uh, a future and uh, uh, 
liability of the city or at least payment over and above the insurance and it came back exactly as I've discussed is that if if the railroad is responsible the railroad is sued say the city and the railroad is sued we would have the tort uh, limited liability under 466 like we do with any with any uh, lawsuit However, if they're suing the railroad and the railroad becomes fully responsible and we have agreed to indemnify them, we have, uh, the, the, their argument is we owe anything over and above what our insurance pays. If that, it's kind of a long answer to your question, but that's the way, that's the way they're, that's the way they're anticipating. And, and I know that we're trying to exhaust every measure I think Reed has pretty much done that mm -hmm. um, as much as possible we've gone back and forth and we've talked to the insurance companies he's been back and forth with the railroad probably a half a dozen or more times regarding this issue already so I'm not sure where it's gonna go other than you either accept the risk or you don't Mr. President. and then uh, just a follow-on um, it's a little hard to read the Attorney General's um, opinion, I guess. Um, can you summarize what that what that means in this discussion? Can I come back to that question? Let me look at it real quick again. Sure. But it, it, essentially, what it's it's saying is is that the city can't do what the, the the city can't accept that indemnification or to indemnify. Uh, them if it's over and above anything that's reasonable we'll just we'll just say it that way because in this case if you read that at least the factual pattern it was that if you could um, state that the amount of money that you're having to pay for this additional insurance premium in this policy or in this uh, scenario that's in the AG's opinion is reasonable and would be reasonable rent it would be allowable but if it's not reasonable it wouldn't be allowable and in this case I'm not going to venture to go there but it's it's uh, it doesn't well the League of Minnesota Cities and myself believe that it's probably violates that AGA AG's opinion Great. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Just wanted to cut, touch on a couple of items. The safety conversation that Mayor Gander and Mr. Galstead had, I would, I, I agree they're speaking the same language. I would just reiterate one step further for the public that's watching and listening is the design of the quiet zone and all the safety elements that are involved in the crossings at second and central have all been reviewed by BNSF and they wouldn't be allowed to move forward without their stamp of approval. So they are, yes, taking the position that the only real safety feature being added to this project is the closing of Third Street. That's the, the only one that guarantees safety is closing a road crossing at a railroad intersection. That said, all of the safety features included in Central and Second make it a more safe crossing than it is today. And, and I think we would all agree with that, that all of the medians that are being added, the updated crossings, the sounds, the lights, the signals, the arms, those are all safety features that are being added that may not exist, or if they do exist, they're outdated to today's standards. So this project moving forward, regardless of BNSF, BNSF's position on whether or not a quiet zone is safe, the intersections themselves are all having safety features added to them. And then the, the other element on the... Um, on the insurance piece of it that I think is worth noting is if, a, say, a vehicle got into an accident on one of those crossings and caused damage, our insurance, the league has basically indicated that uh, auto insurance would cover actual cash value loss only. And so if it needed to be replaced, the difference between actual ca cash value and the total replacement cost, BNSF would expect that difference to be, be borne by the city. Um, and, and finally, on that, again, on that insurance piece of it, um, is to Mayor Gander's point, I think we can, knowing that we have some opinion of Mayor Gander and of the City Council, that I think will offer some negotiating power back to BNSF to try to exhaust every measure we have available to us. Um, but to Mr. Galstead's point, uh, 
by all indications, uh, we've exhausted just about every negotiation we have left with the exception of that one. Um, and the, it sounds like in, historically the success of other cities in Minnesota and counties in Minnesota that have gone through this, it sounds similar to ours. So just we shouldn't uh, have un unrealistic expectations for the success we may have in, in that negotiation. Dale, do you have anything? Hello? Dale, do you have any questions? Can you hear me now? Yes. There, Dale? Yes. Do you have any questions, sir? No, I don't. I've been listening, but I, have, I just finally got the, the uh, microphone to come on, so. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. I've been listening to it, though. I've, I've been paying attention. Okay. Anybody else have any questions right. on this item? All right, move on to number three, discussion on city council and mayor pay rates. Mr. Hutton. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just follow up from our discussion a couple of weeks ago, we did go back further into our history. Um, we did find that the updated council pay rates have been in effect since 2008. Uh, they were approved as part of the city's budget process in the so it's 2007 budget process in effect, January 1st, 2008. Uh, in the RCA, I did include the history of the rates from 2000 to 2007. I did not go back any further than the year 2000. Um, to Council Member Vetter's uh, question regarding how the pay rates should be increased, <clears throat> the city char charter does call for right now that such compensation shall be fixed by the council. Um, so the process for us would be through a budget process, the way it was handled the last time in 2008, or by a city council resolution that would allow for that update to be made. Um, if we wanted it to go to a vote of the city's residents, as Mr. Vetter suggested, um, by my view, uh, Mr. Galstead, we would initially need to uh, look to change the charter to amend the charter and that would require a process of having charter commission meetings and bringing the amended charter to a city vote itself. Um, and that would need to take effect before we could consider what city council pay rates may look like. Um, so that's the background that we've added uh, and certainly open for any questions that anyone may have. Anybody have any questions on that? Great. I entertain a motion to adjourn. Move. Moved by Larson. Second. Second by Reappel. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same aye. sign. Motion is carried, means adjourned.